We try to bring you high quality educational and informational content every single day. Why do you think the price is having such an anemic time? The new story of the hour. Is this the beginning of a massive financial unraveling? We gotta add a little addendum to the show map today. So we start here on the daily. Now we've been looking at the RSI on the Bitcoin's daily chart for the last several days. Well, it's been increasing over the last 50 years since the war. The government. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about the drop that we just saw on Bitcoin over the last 24 hours. In yesterday's live stream and in yesterday's video, we went out about 10 and 11 a.m. respectively. I told you guys that we would likely see a correction down to $35,000. If we broke through there, down to $33,000, $32,500 to $33,000. And then if we fell through there, then we very possibly would break all the way down to $31,800 because we've been looking for some kind of correction over the last couple of weeks after this $13,000 meteoric rally that we've witnessed ever since the beginning of the month of October. And so now we have to come to our uh, come to a conclusion on where's Bitcoin going to go next? Are we going to immediately rocket up to 39 to 41? Probably not. We're probably going to have some correction slash consolidation. Remember, consolidation is sideways movement in time. Correction is movement downwards in price. We're going to have some agreement between those two things, which means downward and to the right a little bit. How much we go down, how much we go sideways, that's what we're trying to determine. But we're going to have some kind of correction as we prepare for that next leg to the upside. Today, we're going to be talking about where that may be in our first segment today on technical analysis. And then we're also going to be diving into our fundamental analysis section talking about the effective federal funds rate, talking about CPI, and I'm also going to be looking at several other charts that are very significant to the price action of, you guessed it, Bitcoin. So let's go ahead and read chat here and jump straight on into it. We've got Joe Bollier in chat coming in first. <clears throat> Said good morning, Jeb. Good morning to you as well. Always with the waving emoji, Joe Bollier. Good to see you, my friend. Mike Lowry's in chat. Said morning. Alex Petway is in chat. Said hello. Queen is in chat. Avilatin is in chat. Morning. Vato. I forget what that means. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? Am I going to get in trouble for saying that on, on stream? Dude. Oh, okay. Vato. Morning, Vato. <laughs> Morning, dude. Uh, let's see. Queen is in chat. Mr. Check 1984 is in chat. Ben Benjamin Bergdorf is in chat. Said, howdy, Jab. Williams in chat. Techno guy in chat. Happy Mac is in chat. Grand Roofing Incorporated in chat. Dawig in chat rj gambling versus trading as a christian thoughts i'll get into that more a little bit later but i definitely think there's a very large difference ask that again in our comment break here in about 20 to 25 minutes and i will definitely go over that alex naibo's in chat jason core is in chat patrick powers in chat i have the beholder bullish on jeb getting into a million subscribers that's what we're going to try and do this bull market we're going to see if we can do it philly skills 1428 said morning jeb how's it going today going pretty well appreciate all of you guys for tuning in ty guy alex kaimana and uh, bah, BNBTC is in chat. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our market watch, and we will dive straight on into it. As you can see right now, Bitcoin is trading at $36,000, up 2.5% over the last seven days. Big headlines are just to keep in mind that the BlackRock ETF is sitting right there, um, you know, waiting to potentially be approved. We've also got, even as Watcher.Guru said right here, Bitcoin briefly fell under $35,000. is back above $35,000 right now. But for a brief moment there, it did fall below $35,000. And another piece of um, headlining data that I'd like to point out is that the fear and greed index is coming down. And this is an early warning indicator of what I've been talking about, which is that a correction is coming on Bitcoin. It is slowly slowly, gradually shifting away from greed just a couple of days ago to fear. Now, we're still at 70, which means we're in high greed territory. But the thing that I want all of you to keep in mind is that we have to see a correction at some point. And fear and greed coming down a little bit is going to give us the unction that we need to see that drop. In fact, it is the thing that is documenting the fact that that correction is coming. And so we want to keep that healthily in mind mind one all, one other piece of data to point out here on the cryptocurrency market you can see the overall market capitalization for cryptocurrency this is a basically the total market capitalization chart over on trading view on a uh, on a linear chart excuse me on a regular chart rather than logarithmic chart <clears throat> you can see that we've been gradually moving to the upside pretty aggressively over the last year we're currently at 1.4 trillion dollars 
1.39, as you can see up here at the top of the screen. Whereas not long ago, about a year ago, we were sitting at 850 billion. We've added almost 900 billion with a B dollars in market capitalization in a year. It's a pretty big deal. One of the fastest appreciations in market uh, in um, market capitalization going into the total charts that we've ever seen in the history of Bitcoin. Yes, obviously, we saw a faster appreciation during the last bull market, but we did not see this fast of an appreciation during the lead up to that bull market. So what will this next bull market look like? Remember, this is a linear chart. This is not even logarithmic. In the lead up to the last bull market, we went from $120 billion dollars to about $335 billion. Yes, that's about a triple. That was $200 billion coming in. This was $900 billion coming in. This is a significantly larger market. And a lot of that value that came in during the last bull market decided to stay. And much of it is coming back with ease. Today, Bitcoin is trading at $708 billion in market capitalization. Ethereum at $242. Not quite reaching that glorious $1 trillion combined market capitalization between the two of them, but we're not far away. I do think that you'll see that within the next two to three months. Binance sitting at $252. Solana at $62. Massive rally in the last seven days. This is one of the reasons why I advocate for a broad index fund style investment approach to the cryptocurrency markets. Try and invest in the cryptocurrency markets by buying either the top 10, the top 15, the top 20, the top 30, the top 25, the top 40, the top 45, the top 50, whatever, the top such and such. You know, there's not enough blue chip cryptocurrencies in the market to recommend buying the top 500 like you would in the stock market through the S&P. But if you were to buy the top 50, like instead of the S&P, let's call it the, the B and E, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum 50, the B and E 50, you know, somebody needs to make an index fund called that. We've already got an ETF coming for Ethereum that was proposed by BlackRock. Big news. Big, big news. That will probably get approved also. If those two are approved within the next couple of year, within the next year, excuse me, because the deadlines are within the year or within the next 12 months, um, Ethereum is about eight and a half months from now. Bitcoin's about five months from now. If those actually do get approved, who's to stop BlackRock from also trying to go for a Solana or a Cardano or a Tron or a Binance or an XRP ETF? Who's to stop them from doing that? And after you've got five or 10 altcoins, who's to stop somebody from coming coming and doing the easy work of packaging them into an index fund that you pitch to people that are trying to retire? The majority of the people that watch this channel are millennials and Gen Xers. There's a few boomers, there's a few Zoomers like me, but generally speaking, for some reason, you guys are coming to listen to a guy that's 15 years or younger talk about markets. I couldn't tell you why. You guys can feel free to tell me why in the chat. My point, that generation, those two generations, the millennials, and especially the Gen Xers, which there's a lot of you Gen Xers watching this right now. The Gen Xers and the Millennials are trying to catch up and actually be able to retire. And they know that if they invest in the cryptocurrency market somehow, that they have the ability to beat the stock market. I'm not saying neglect your stock portfolio. You should absolutely have that. But they're looking for some way to, with a good degree of confidence, beat the stock market and catch up to where they need to be to be able to retire at, you know, 67 at the latest. Some people want to retire 62. Some people want to retire 55. They're trying to figure out how can they get there. Everybody isn't here to try and get a flashy Lambo. And I think the crypto industry has missed that. There's a lot of lay people here and there's nothing wrong with that. That just want to be able to retire on time. They just want to be able to have enough money for their kids college, whatever it is. And cryptocurrency is presenting an opportunity for that. The way that I recommend to make the most money in cryptocurrency reliably and then ladder on top of that other investment strategies like a moon bag in Dogecoin or like, you know, dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin forever. The way that I recommend to make the money, the most consistent profit in the cryptocurrency space is to gradually invest in a bunch of things by the market, if you will. There's no S&P 500, so you have to do your own individually managed index fund, if you will. And then from there, you can go and buy other altcoins. Sure, go for it. But do that, you will create wealth. Crypto cats in chat, Bitcoin training is in chat. Um, Joey Van Englenberg is in chat. I love those. I love those German names. They're very fun to pronounce. Joey Van Englenberg. Mike Lowry said, you're smart, honest, straight to the point, caring, non-judgmental, etc. That's why I'm here and continue to support your efforts. Keep it up, Jeb. Well, thank you, Mike Lowry. I appreciate that. Except for one thing. I am a little bit judgmental on dumb thoughts, but I will not, I will not be mean to the person. I like to separate the, uh, action from the actor, the sin from the sinner, the wretchedness from the wretch. I like to look at people as people and actions as good or bad, not people as good or bad as much as I can avoid it. Now, there are cases where some things are just so bad that you kind of have to look at it that way, but I hope you understand my point. Before we jump into our stream today, I do want to let you guys know, I do want to let you guys know that today's episode of Coffee and Crypto is brought to you in part 
by none other than Apex Exchange. If you guys are not familiar with Apex Exchange, it is a decentralized exchange that allows leverage trading. There's no KYC, and it also has a very similar interface to Bybit. So for any of you guys that are familiar with Bybit, Apex will look very, very similar. It is the exchange that I personally do my leverage trading on whenever I do leverage trading. I don't do a ton of it, to be totally honest with you, but when I do, I am really enjoying using Apex for that trading and it has uh worked very well for me i used to use bybit back in the day before all the stuff came down i don't want bybit to be forced to shut down my account and the government to come in and say you have to take all of jeb's currency and give it to the government and confiscate it because he's not supposed to be on that in the united states so i prefer using apex because it doesn't have kyc it's a decentralized exchange so it will never have kyc it's not like they're going to change that one day in the future it's a dex i mean come on so you continue to have custody over your cryptocurrency that's something i want to mention about apex if you guys didn't realize Decentralized exchanges mean that you still keep custody over your cryptocurrency in your wallet. You're just kind of putting it out there to trade with it, but it's still based in your own wallet. That's the difference between a decentralized exchange and a centralized exchange. A centralized exchange, you send your funds to the exchange and they hold on to it and then you trade with it. A decentralized exchange, you are holding onto the funds in your own wallet. That's why it says right here, connect wallet. And from there, that's where you're making your trades. So if something happens to the exchange, you're not going to lose it like you would with FTX. You'd have to pull it out of the smart contract and boom, it's still yours. So there's a lot more security and stability there, which is why many people are flocking to DEXs. And in case you're wondering if decentralized exchanges, excuse me, if you're wondering if Apex Exchange is the place to go, come on over here to CoinMarketCap. They are always in the top 10. A lot of times they're up here in the top three or top four. And in my experience, they are the best, uh, most user-friendly decentralized leverage trading platform that I have found. So if you are in a position where you believe that you are safe enough, experienced enough, you're going to use your stop losses, you're going to be wise, you're going to do all of those things, you're going to be safe because leverage trading, of course, is very powerful, which means it can make you a lot of money, but it can also lose you a lot of money. If you're in a position that you believe you're safe enough to trade with leverage, I think Apex is your go-to bet. All right. Hashtag Finsovs in chat. Let's go ahead and jump straight on to our technical analysis. We've got a lot to cover today, so let's dive straight on into it. Bitcoin right now trading at $36,194. Yesterday, we went live on this blue vertical line give me one second on this blue vertical line is where we were live and i was talking about bitcoin's propensity for having a market correction after a major market rally which we have witnessed over the last couple of months bitcoin since about september 11th has rallied 52 percent thirteen thousand dollars over 58 days massive rally no doubt in that time period we have seen a massive massive um amount of appreciation into the market and we've also begun to see the be uh, and we've also seen the beginnings of a crash of a correction and we shall see where it goes yesterday we were live around this blue vertical line and i gave you guys the analysis that says that bitcoin will go to one of these three white levels here i don't know if i have the third one down here i don't so i'll go ahead and draw it that it would go to one of these three white levels thirty five thousand dollars if it breaks through $35,000, then we would fall down to 32,935 range, down to about 32,500. That's the 0.5% Fibonacci level. 32,935 is a level that we set on the 22nd of January, 2022. Massive bottom. I'll show you that really quickly, just so you know I'm not pulling numbers out of you know where. That number comes from right here. It might be January 20th. I think it's January 22nd. January 24th. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I was off two days. I'm so sorry. Right here. 32,935, massive market bottom was our first major market bottom in the bear market. So 32,935, ma uh, majorly important level because it has been important before. And that's kind of how support and resistance works. It's set once and then not so much forevermore, but for a very long time, it is extremely relevant. We said we were going to 35. If we broke through 35, then we're going to 32 and a half to 32,9. Or, and if we break through that, we're going to 30, uh, 31. Well, pretty much within three hours of me saying that, what I said happened which is, you know, just comedic timing because as an, an you know, you got to take your wins where you can get them as analysts because sometimes you say stuff and because there's technical analysis pointing to it, but there is a degree of randomness in the market because the market ultimately moves based on the manifestation of the machinations of traders. What does that mean? Well, the machinations are your thoughts. What are you thinking? Well, the traders manifest those thoughts into a trade. So the manifestation, the working of the hands of the traders in an exchange moves the market. So there's a degree of randomness there because people are fickle and they can change their mind on a dime and sometimes they don't follow the technicals and sometimes they do whatever they want. People are weird. I'm one of them. I would know. You might also know some of those people. You might also know some humans and know how strange they are. So sometimes the market just gives you some weird nonsense and you have to come back to basics. But a lot of times, 
you can predict with a good degree of accuracy what the market's going to do. It's not all the time that you predict what's going to happen and then two hours later it does it, and that's kind of what happens. So I, I'm just kind of happy about that. Technical analysis, again, gets the credit there, not me. I am simply a disciple of TA, and I want to share that with you however I can. Nevertheless, we did fall back down to exactly $35,000, the level that we said we would go to. Why $35,000? Well, it's a big even. If you follow the principles of technical analysis, you would know why this level was tested for two reasons. Number one, $35,000 is a big even. It is a nice, big, flashy, attractive number between four, between 30 and 40. It's not 32,935, right? That number kind of is a little bit strange. It's just a random number. It does have bearing on the market from back in the day, but it is not just a number that you're going to create out of thin air, generally speaking. It is also the level, the other reason we went to 35 was because 35 was the high over here. So this is actually good news for you bulls out there that think I'm crazy and we're not going to have a correction because Bitcoin actually fell back down to its previous resistance here at 35 and bounced and is rallying. So that's wonderful news. It did actually hold at 35. That's great. I'm all for that. I would to a certain degree, prefer a little bit more corrective movement. I would actually prefer for Bitcoin to come down to 33, but the bulls not lose heart and it bounce and then it go through a bigger rally. Just so we can have some kind of reset correction. That'd be a $5,000 drop. Everybody was getting onto my case like, Jeb, you said five to $8,000 drop. That's crazy. How's that going to happen? Well, if we drop $5,000, that'd be down to 33. If we drop $8,000, that could be all the way down to 30,000. That's our app. That's pretty much the floor of the market that I'm calling right now. That's where I got five to $8,000 correction somewhere in there would be what I'd like to see happen. I would like to see a five to $8,000 correction, either down to 33 or even all the way down to 30. And then that would be a large enough correction to say, all righty, we're going to get going here because we've got a lot of exuberance. Also gives us more upside potential to be able to make some gains and some profit. That's what I'd like to happen. What I'd like to happen does not matter. And so as analysts, we have to remember that. What I'd like to happen is not what is going to happen, right? This is The, the market is not... A, a child. It is not an employee. It is not somebody that you can tell what to do and it's going to do it. It just doesn't work that way. So I would like it to do that. Is it going to do that? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Now, <clears throat> I guess that kind of leads us to our primary question of today's technical analysis section, and that is whether or not Bitcoin will drop below $35,000. Just quickly make sure everything's good here. Everything good on the stream? I think you guys are good. All right. Good deal. All right. Let's keep going here. Um, we have a downtrend right here on the one hourly chart uh, that has been pushing us to the downside. We're currently uh, testing this as resistance, and I think this is going to be a pretty telling test because eventually this downtrending level of resistance will push us into breaking below $35,000. And if you'll remember, we, um, we got up here. Who's ever seen the first Iron Man movie? Just show of hands, show of hands. Let's just all sit right down, sit down right here on the podium. Okay, sit down. No, I'm just kidding. We watched the Iron Man movie recently. This is going to be an analogy. If you have watched the Iron Man movie, first one, you know, then, you know, Tony Stark, he's like, oh, I'm going to see if I can go and beat the SR-71 Blackbird's um, altitude record. He flies up and he starts to ice and then his, his engines go out. And all of a sudden, he's still moving up, but he's slowing down because he has no acceleration because his, you know, his little feet thrusters, little ion thrusters, whatever they're called, you know, the, the little magic feet that he has. They stopped working because they froze over. And he, and he keeps going up, but he starts slowing down. And then eventually he gets to the top and he freezes solid. And then you're like, crap, dude's about to fall and hit the Pacific Ocean. My question for you is, have we hit that um, icing point for Bitcoin yet? Have we hit the point where we've rallied so far that like Icarus, we've gotten too close to the sun and our wings have burned up. Or like Iron Man, we've gotten too close to the to the open space that we've frozen over. I don't know if any of you guys caught the Icarus analogy there in the first Iron Man, but that was absolutely intentional. Have, have we like Icarus flown too close to the sun and our wings have melted? Have we like Iron Man flown too close to the moon and our rocket thrusters have frozen over? The 21st century's analogy to Icarus. Have we done that? Potentially. Because now we're in a correction, and we have not seen a correction to this size in a while. We've already dropped $3,000. I'm not saying that's the biggest deal in the world. I'm not saying that's, you know, that, that has to be scary. But what I am saying is that Bitcoin absolutely needs to prove to us now that it's still in a rally. Because the fact that, because the idea that Bitcoin is currently in a rally, we've now dropped enough to throw that into doubt. 
Bitcoin has dropped by $3,000. And especially in the last 24 hours, we've seen a large enough correction to throw into doubt that we're in a rally at all. And to remain in a rally, we now have to break above at least 37.5. This is the thing I've been warning you guys about all week. And nobody wanted to hear it. But I'm glad I said it, even though it was unpopular at the time. We are starting to look for corrections here. The market now needs to break above $37,500 to prove to us that it is in a rally. At the moment, we are already in the correction that we've talked about. Yesterday, I came in and I said, look, 35 is in the cards. It's probably going to happen soon. It happened within three hours. Now I'm saying, look, $33,000 is around the corner if we can't break above this downtrending level of resistance. This downtrending level of resistance is kind of our gate and key. If we can break through this and break up to 37.5, great. We're continuing into a, into a rally. If we can break above this and go up to 37.5 and then drop and pull back down to 35 and bounce around here, then great. We're trading sideways. But if we cannot break above this downtrend, then the only other thing that we can do, because there's only two levels that are contending for Bitcoin right now, is we can break below 35. So we have to watch this downtrend right here on the hourly chart very closely. This is the most important downtrend in Bitcoin's short-term technical analysis at the moment. Most important trend line, I should say, not just downtrend. Most important trend line in Bitcoin's analysis right now. There's also another trend line that just kind of jumped out at me right there. So just keep this one in mind too, but I wouldn't say this is as important. This is what I call chart vision, by the way. I was just kind of like, I had this thought, I'm like, wait a minute, I wonder if there's another trend line I ought to show. Oh, wait a minute, look at that. So just tell me if you can see that trend line. Can you guys see that trend line there? I can see it. It's right there. Boom. That's what six years of charting will do for you. This channel turns six years old tomorrow. Got a special announcement coming up tomorrow that relates to that, so stay tuned. Anyway, Bitcoin is currently contending with both of those levels. We were contending with both of them before, as you can see here, but one of them was support. Bitcoin was not able to hold it. When we fell below that level, that's when we dropped. That's when we went through that drop yesterday. Right now, both of those levels are now resistance. So just think about that. We were not able to break through one of them when they were resistance, and we were not able to hold the other one when it was support. Well, now the support, which was support here, has turned into a resistance here. So what's the likelihood that we're going to bounce and rally here when we've actually already gone through a massive rally here, about a $1,000 rally, when over here we were much more, um, we hadn't gone through that drop yet. We hadn't had to rally $1,000 yet. We could have broken through there. What's the likelihood we're going to break through these two levels right here and we couldn't even hold them right here? Low. Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Statistically speaking, probably not. There are some exciting factors coming up on the four-hourly chart that could indicate a little bit of a rally here. We've got a uh, we've got bullish MACD cross potentially coming in on the four-hourly chart. We've got RSI crossing bullish here on the four-hourly chart. Uh, Lux Algo's probably got something to say about this, except we don't have a buy signal yet, so that's telling. Take a look at that. We don't have the buy signal yet. Lux Algo is just always absolutely smashing it, guys. By the way, stay tuned for some stuff on Lux Algo. You're not going to want to miss it. Lux Algo uh, not giving us a buy signal. We're going to have to rally probably up to about 36.8 to get a buy signal, at least. And good. I don't think we should have a buy signal on Lux Algo until then. By the way, just so you know, Lux Algo called this also yesterday, even before I did. This was, I called it at, you know, about, you know, about 10 the next day, we were calling for a correction here. We saw the, the sell signal here on the four-hourly chart. 1,900 hours. We were already calling for 35, uh, 35 to 34, 35 and a half down to 34 and a half thousand dollar correction. This is what Lux Algo did, just back testing it to show you. Run it forward, and that's exactly where we went. Hopefully, you could see that. Hopefully, you saw what happened there. Lux Algo called this movement down here, and then that's exactly what happened. We went straight to the middle of the take profit. Lux Algo absolutely nailed it, as usual. I don't know how they do it. I am not a developer. I'm not an indicator developer. All I know is I know how to use the indicators. And these indicators just absolutely knock it out of the park. If you guys have not already signed up for Lux Algo, you absolutely should. Because today's show is brought to you in part by Lux Algo. And you can use coupon code JEB30, J-E-B-B-30, for 30% off at checkout, and you can get access to the number one technical indicator in the entire space. And people say that lightly. Oh, it's the number one this, it's the number one that. No, I'm literally saying the number one. As in, Lux Algo was the company that changed the paradigm on technical indicators, on paid technical indicators. Before Lux Algo came around, they were all scams. And they had a connotation for it. Everybody thought, oh, paid technical indicator, that must be a scam. Must be just some random little five lines of code some dude in, coll in a college dorm wrote, and he's trying to make a million bucks off of it. No, but Lux Algo came out with an indicator that actually knocks it out of the park. 
and completely change the landscape. And now there's hundreds of imposters. I was on the phone with Sean the other day, the guy that founded Lux Algo. And I'm like, just so you know, there, you got you have a bunch of imposters and you ought to take that as a compliment because that's what they say, right? You have imposter, people trying to impersonate you as a compliment. So just get take the compliment in case you haven't in case you haven't realized that people are trying to be are, are trying to impersonate you but Lux Algo is the real OG and I'm very excited to tell you that I've been sharing you uh, sharing them with you guys and working with Lux Algo for almost 3 years now it's probably coming up on 3 years very soon and they have been an absolutely incredible company to me I'm very good friends with the creator I think he's a good guy and uh I know that he's got a heart to help people I know he's got a heart to really uh, share with the community something that's going to bring them value and help you guys to be successful in trading and in cryptocurrency. And uh, I'm really excited about Lux Algo. So make sure to sign up using coupon code JEB30 with the link in the description box down below. All right, let's go ahead and read some chat. And then we're going to jump into some fundamentals. A lot of those fundamentals will also be charts. So don't worry, but we're going to jump into that here in just a second. <clears throat> Anything longer than a sentence is blocked. <clears throat> really? Blockchain RWA is asking for Chainlink TA. Hashtag Finsaw. Maybe we can look at that here for a second. Guys, make sure to hit that like button if you have not already. Let's get to 150 likes real quick. Thank you for tuning in. Greetings from Montevideo, Uruguay. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's a Dutch name. Oh, no. I'm sorry. On the border. But has a lot of similarities with the German ones. Sorry. Joey van Engelenburg. The uh, what is the like the name of the fa of the of the like the you know you have the romantic languages. What is the like the grouping of languages for the German languages? By the way, guys, we got about three minutes, three to four minutes of reading chat here, and then we're gonna jump straight back into some comments. So drop some comments if you want to see, and then we'll jump straight back into it. I love interacting with you guys here in chat. Have you considered putting on a local in-person class? I have thought about that, but to be honest with you, I'm just not sure if it would. I'm not sure if it would work, to be honest. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to try it sometime. I would like to try it. I, maybe I'm being a little too hard on myself. I would like to try it. I may do that. RJ asks, gambling versus trading. Great question. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, you should go to Lux Algo and interview the owner and check out his facilities. That would be cool, Crypto Surge said. Yeah, it would be cool to bring Sean on uh, on the channel. I've thought about doing that, and he wants to collaborate with me also. We, we probably will end up doing an interview together in the future. All right, going to read uh, Germanic. Yeah, I know Germanic, but I, I didn't know if there was... Is Germanic like the class, the family of languages? It's not just the, the actual language. That's probably true. R gambling versus trading. Really quickly, my perspective on gambling versus trading. When you are trading, you are taking a calculated um, bet based on a lot of data. When you are gambling, you're simply saying this or that. You know, you're pulling a slot machine, you're playing blackjack, you are doing something where the analysis of the outcome is at least almost completely out of your hands. There are things in a casino that you can do to put the odds in your favor by one or 2%. Like you can count cards in blackjack and you'll win 51% of the time instead of 50% of the time. That's not how it works with trading. There is so much that goes into analyzing where a market is and where a market is going that you need to watch out for when you are trading and that you can watch out for and that you can do to put the odds in your favor. It is not just as simple as saying, all right, I'm going to make a gamble and I have a maybe less than 50% chance of even making money here. If you're setting yourselves up with a with a um with a trade where you've not put in the put the research into um figuring out why this trade is going to happen where it's going to go where you should put your take profit where you should put your stop loss where you should put your entry if you're going to use leverage how much leverage you ought to use if you're looking at indicators what do the indicators say if you're looking at the fundamentals what do the fundamentals say is there any news around the corner what's the market sentiment what's the fear and greed what are the what are the support resistance levels is there a trend line is there a moving average what does macd say what does rsi say if you're not looking at all of that stuff then yes you're gambling when you trade if you're just opening an, an exchange and going I think I'm going to go long now. Yeah, you're gambling. <clears throat> if you're doing the technical analysis, it is not gambling. And that is a great point, I think. And, you know, if I do say so myself, forgive me for the maybe the pride there. But it's a point that I think we need to hear that technical analysis is the thing that makes trading not gambling. Analysis is the thing that makes trading not gambling. It is the thing that makes trading a profitable enterprise. Technical analysis is that. So do not forget. 
do not forget that technical and fundamental analysis are the ways that we turn trading from gambling into investment. Doesn't mean we're going to make every trade correctly. I can guarantee you, if you make enough trades, you're going to lose some. But, if you were doing your analysis, the odds will be in your favor and you'll win on the statistics. All right. Again, great question. Thank you very much for that. Yes, German is a Germanic language. English and Dutch are too and some more. That's true. That's right. That's right, because English is a... Um, what would it be? Anglo-Saxon? Is that, is that what you would say with the language, or is that the culture? I'm not sure. It's an Anglo-Saxon language? I don't know. Um, Saxon, obviously, from Saxony over on mainland Europe. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, we're. I, I guess English is a Germanic and a Romantic language. That's why you have things like... Uh, um, you have... There's a bunch of things in the United in the English language that have two words for it, and one of them is German, and one of them is roman is romantic. All right, are we in a bull market at the moment? Coming right up, we're coming into a bull market. Yes, I think that we're moving into a bull market. I'm pretty, conf um, I'm pretty um, excited to say that I, I think we are definitely moving into that. You should bring Sean on a member stream. It's not a bad idea, crypto mini bike. That is not a bad idea. Let's go ahead and move on here. We've got a lot of fundamental analysis to cover and not a lot of time to cover it. So let's go ahead and jump straight on into it, dive straight on into it. The fundamental analysis I want to start with today is the effective federal funds rate because the effective federal funds rate is going to be having a change in 28 days. Um, I believe that's coming up in December, December 13th. There is a 99.8% chance that the Fed, uh, that the CME is giving of a Fed rate pause and the reason that this is so uh, substantial is because if there is a rate pause that would change everything everything changes if there's a fed rate pause you might think well jeff wait a minute they don't do anything and that changes everything what gives no i'm serious i'm about to show you so stay tuned and hit the like button subscribe to the channel how that would change everything that would completely change everything to find out how that will completely change everything we've got to go on over to the effective federal funds rate chart on trading view and we've got to take a look here turning off lux algo because it's not designed for this kind of chart because it's not a chart it's just a reading out of what a, a regulator is doing go to regular and we can see the change of the effective federal funds rate over time let's really quickly overlay the effective federal funds rate over bitcoin so that we can see the time frame that we're dealing with the effective federal funds rate by the way just a little bit of a history lesson you can see when these changes were occurring the effective federal funds rate is the overnight banking transfer interest rate for banks borrowing money from the fed the fed is the central bank of central banks there are 12 smaller fed banks and then you have the fed itself which is a coming together of those banks and that is the united states national federal reserve <clears throat> you've got one in uh, san francisco you've got one in uh, oklahoma city i think you've got one in new york you've got 12 of them and then you've got the fed coming together um in the fed and the federal reserve has two major tools that it can employ it can employ interest rates it can employ um quantitative easing and tightening through the purchasing or the rolling off and selling of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities so they can manipulate the currency supply by buying by printing money to buy stuff from the market creating artificial demand they are the demand side of the equation which allows for them to buy things out of the market with new money injecting liquidity into the market they're not the treasury they do not print new currency that's not the fed's job that's the treasury's job but they can inject liquidity which is basically a button that says new money into the market by buying things and holding on to them themselves they're basically the largest investor in investor in mortgage-backed securities um that you've ever heard of the largest single investor in mortgage-backed securities that is, that is in existence and so they put about nine trillion dollars in the market and they can manipulate the interest rates um that nine trillion dollars is just nine trillion dollars of demand side pressure that has now caused a bunch of inflation they're bringing that down by rolling it off but that's one of the tools that they have in their disposal they also have the interest rates essentially the fed was originally set up in the early 1900s as a lender of last resort was the phrasing that was used if a bank was going to go bankrupt and they couldn't borrow money from any other banks because they were all about to go bankrupt too, then they could go and borrow money from the Fed. And if the Fed had to, the Fed had the unilateral authority to print money to make sure that that bank didn't go insolvent because the theory goes that if we stop a bank from going insolvent and all of those people from losing their deposits and going back to living in a cave because they're so poor they can't afford to rub two nickels together and buy bread to eat and so they're going to starve, then it'd be better that we create money out of thin air for a second to make sure that bank doesn't go under so all those poor little people that have a bank account don't go broke. 
because there were bank runs happening every couple of years and banks would go under and they would just collapse. And frankly, that's kind of a compelling theory, right? Better to let them borrow money that they pay back on a fixed schedule than for the whole bank to go under and everybody loses all their deposits. The FDIC didn't exist back then. So Federal Deposit Insur Insurance Corporation, that didn't exist back then. You didn't have FDIC insurance up to $250,000. If your bank went under, you were screwed. You just, you're just screwed is what you are. You are screwed. You're up a creek without a paddle and you're screwed, right? No money for you. So the Fed was created to be the lender of last resort. It grew, got bigger, started to be the thing that pulls the strings behind the United States economy. And that, you know, obviously we have issues with that. But the whole lender of last resort idea actually does make some sense. But nevertheless, the Fed has two tools. Interest rates, quantitative easing. Those are their two tools to, man to maintain their dual mandate, which is maximum employment, otherwise stated as minimum unemployment, and price stability, not minimum inflation. They don't reach for target inflation. They're reaching for something called price stability. That's the exact term that you're going to hear from the Fed. Maximum employment, or said otherwise, minimum unemployment, which is a double negative, so just say maximum employment, and price stability. They want to maintain price stability around 2% inflation a year. You do need to have a little bit of inflation in an economy because the economy is growing. So if you don't have any inflation in the economy, then you go into disinflation because if you have 0% inflation and the economy grows and the economy runs away from you and then you go into deinflationary territory and if you go into a deinflationary spiral, you can shut down the whole economy because it's better to hold on to your currency than to deploy it. You stop investment in the economy and the whole thing grinds to a halt. So you do actually want to have a little bit of inflation. That's why most central banks target 2%. They want to target the growth of GDP. So they're targeting for 2% GDP growth. So they're targeting for 2% inflation. So they run in tandem. So they're not going apart from each other. Because when GDP growth and inflation start to split apart, that's when you start running into trouble. We've had a lot of that in the last three years. So <clears throat> history lesson over. Let's talk about the Fed and why this effective federal funds rate not changing is revolutionary and why, we have, and why this would change everything. This is the effective federal funds rate chart. It is showing the hikes and the effective federal funds rate, it was 0%, which meant if a bank went and borrowed money from the Fed, they got it for free, basically. That's essentially what that meant. If they borrow money from the Fed, they would be charged no interest. That Just so you know what that means, that's essentially what that means. All right. What happened in March of 2022 is the United States, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war had just begun, and there was a unilateral understanding inside of NATO and inside of the European Union that Russia is collapsing as a modern state. And with Russia collapsing as a modern state via demography, they are running out of people and the people that they have don't have a pleasant outlook on where their country is going. So they don't want to have kids. So they've got a bunch of people that are getting old and dying and they don't have many young people that are even there, let alone that want to have kids. Their birth rates through the floor. They are falling off into demographic oblivion. And Russia realizes NATO's expanding. We have to make a move now to secure our borders or we never will be able to. And so the Russian-Ukrainian war began. There was a unilateral uh, understanding around NATO that if Kiev falls, which it looked like it would for the first couple of weeks, if Kiev falls, Russia will be knocking on about five countries' doors, maybe six, including Finland. You've got Finland, which was at the time not a NATO member. They are now. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, former Russian states, Poland, with the blood plains of Poland is what they're called. They're called that for a reason, because when Western Europe and Russia go at it, Poland is the place that they fight. And then you've got Romania, and then I've, I forgot to throw uh, Moldova in there, but Moldova's the seventh. Those seven nations would all be invaded by Russia. Before the Russian-Ukrainian war, five of them were in NATO, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, and Romania. Moldova was not, but Moldova's already basically overrun by Russians anyway, and Finland was not in NATO at the beginning of the war. For Russia to secure its borders, it's always had to fill in the gaps between the mountains, going down to the Black Sea and going up to the, going up to the, um, uh, the Black Sea and the, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, I'm forgetting my geography, the Nordic Sea. What am I trying to say? What is the name of that ocean? What is the name of that sea? Anyway, they have to fill those two gaps. I'll just go ahead and show you on a, on a map here because this will make this a little bit more simple. Jeb, what does this have to do with what is the Baltic Sea? Thank you. Goodness gracious. I'm talking too quick. I know the name of the ocean, the sea. What does this have to do with the effective federal funds rate? I'm going to show you in just a second, but I thought this would be interesting because it'll give you a lot more context. The Russians, I almost tried to go over here and grab my pen tool like it's a chart. The Russians are over here. This is all flat. Ukraine, flat. Belarus, flat. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, flat. Poland, flat. Romania, eh, part of it's flat. Romania extends from the mountains up here, the Alps, 
down to the Baltic Sea. This gap right here is one of the entryways into the former Soviet space. Then you've also got what they call the Blood Plains of Poland, which Warsaw is in the very center of. If you're Polish, you know how much travesty has happened in Poland because of its geography. The Russians, as they are collapsing, want to be able to go to the retirement home of nations and not be invaded while they are completely falling apart and splitting into 50 different sub-nations and fiefdoms that are going to fight to the brutal end. And so they want to plug up these two gaps so that NATO can't get to them. They want to invade at least half of Poland, the same way they did in the Second World War, and they want to invade at least half of Romania, probably up to Bucharest, uh, Bucharest and uh, fill in this gap right here. To do that, they have to go through Ukraine. And so there is a unilateral understanding in NATO that if they take Ukraine... Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia are next. They're already allies with Belarus. So they don't have to invade there. Poland's next and Romania's next. That would, tra that would trigger an Article 5. Uh, that would, that would um, cause an Article 5 trigger in NATO, which means that the entirety of NATO would be brought to arms against Russia. That would start as a conventional arms war. Russia would get absolutely face rolled. I'm, I'm talking like a killer death robot against an army of fire ants kind of destruction. They would get absolutely annihilated by NATO. And NATO realized that they would be so strong and Russia is backed into such a corner that if that fight ever occurred, Russia would be so completely decimated that not only would they not be able to achieve their desires that they absolutely have to achieve, taking all the way to Poland and Romania. This is stated, by the way. This is not just speculation. Russia has come out and stated that this is their goal. Right? Let's be clear on that. This is not speculation. This is fact. And so with their army completely decimated by NATO, they would be left with one option, and that is nuclear warfare. And that is the end of modern civilization as we know it. And so that's why, you know, you can go all political all you want about Ukraine, but it is imperative for, ever, for the continuation of modern society that Ukraine um, does not fall. Now, why did I bring this up? What does this have to do with the effect of federal funds, right? Because that's still our point. It's a side point that builds into that. Look at the timing. This is where I pull it together. Pull it all back together. War started February 20th. Effective federal funds rate first hike happens one month later. March 18th, 2022. The effective federal funds rate was already going to go through a hiking cycle. This was already going to occur. But the United States leading NATO. By the way, there's two major ways that a... Uh, large uh, um, family of nations alliance like that can um, go. Either you don't have a leader of the alliance and then nobody knows what they're doing or you have one leader of the alliance and everybody follows them. That's how it's always happened throughout history. The United States is obviously the leader of NATO. We founded it. We're the biggest by far. So basically what we say goes and we don't want them to march into Poland because then we have to go to war with Russia and we much prefer, pro and we much prefer proxy war. So, you know, Ukraine's doing us a solid basically. The Fed, being part of the United States government, realizes, wait a minute, we got to get this we got to get this economy under control because we need to have a wartime economy if something were to happen. We can't have rampant inflation. Who forgot about the CPI? Right? It's not going to show up on Trading View very well. But who forgot about the CPI? It was huge. Up here is massively high. In by June of 2022, we were sitting at 9.6 percent. Target 2 percent. That's five times over over target. I'm on the wrong chart. Sorry. So the Fed realizes, okay, wait a minute, World War III might be around the corner. We got to get the economy under control. And so they start hiking. The, they start hiking. 25 basis point hike. 50 basis point hike. A basis point is just a hundredth of a percent. So 25, uh, 0.25% hike. 0.50% hike. 75 basis point hike. 75 basis point hike. 75, 75, 50, 25, 25, 25. Pause, 25. Pause. That brings us to today. Hopefully you can see the trend there. It ramped up and it ramped down. They kind of gradually moved into it, gradually moved out of it because they're trying to make it as smooth as possible so businesses don't feel the jolt. Because as the effective federal funds rate changes, every other interest rate changes. Every other interest rate is based on the effective federal funds rate. So they're trying not to, you know, shock the economy too hard. That's not their goal is to just grind things to a halt. They're trying to change things gradually. 25, 50, 75, 75, 75, 75, 50, 25, 25, 25. You can see the trend there. The trend over the last six months has been a 25 basis point hike, followed by a pause, followed by a 25 basis point hike. So on average, every meeting is 12 and a half, but they're actually doing it by 0.25. This meeting, if the trend were to continue, we would have expected, just go to the actual EFFR chart so that the Bitcoin chart isn't in the way. If that trend were to continue, the... um. The um, 25 followed by a pause, followed by a 25, followed by a pause, followed by a 25, then we would be expecting a 25 basis point rate hike right here. That's the trend. That's what we would be expecting. But that's not what's predicted. And CME is right. 
And the reason that CME is right is because CPI is so low. CPI is sitting down here at 3.2. Generally speaking, what the Fed does is they raise the effective federal funds rate to get 1% or 2% above CPI, and then they bring them down in tandem. Bring CPI back down to 2%. After it's at 2%, then they'll drop it back down to 0 or back down to 1% or 2%, whatever it may be. <clears throat> they are getting the results that they need right now. And so they're not going to go through another hiking cycle. They're just not going to do it. There's no reason for them to go above five and a quarter. This one page right here. Let me just do my very best not to overstate this. Just kidding, you can't. This website and this prediction is the single most important piece of economic data in the entire world world right now there is not another piece of economic data other than the effective federal funds rate for the united states of america that is more impactful on globe on the global economy anywhere in the world and the prediction of 99.8 percent likelihood that we're going to see a pause means that the cycle is breaking it means that they are going to do one of two things either one they're going to be one two skip a few instead of one skip one one skip one they're going to go to one hike, pause three times, pause four times, and then a hike. Or they've just paused. When the market sees that there's a pause in 28 days, because there almost certainly will be, <clears throat> the market is going to think, oh man, we're out of the hiking cycle. We're in the pause cycle. That happens throughout history. This is the last 30 years of hikes, last 20 years of hikes. After a hiking cycle, we sit up here and pause. And then what happens pretty soon thereafter? You go through the correction. They drop the rates. When you drop interest rates is one of the most bullish times in a market that you're ever going to experience in the in all of your investment journey. And so that gives us a lot of economic exuberance. You can see when we were dropping the interest rates right here, that was because we were trying to pull back out of the pan, uh, out of the 2008 financial crisis. It ended up sending us through a rally after those rates were dropped to the floor. Because it stimulates the economy, you get cheaper money, easier to take on debt, easier to finance massive buildings and cruise ships and, uh, you know, train lines and uh, passenger cargo services and all those things. Drop the interest rates here, massive rally. Same thing's going to happen. The interest rates will pause, and maybe they'll pause here. By the way, it would make sense. This is the exact same level that we, that we went to pre-2008, so there actually is a historical precedence for pausing here. And if we do pause there... And we go through that drop in the next 12 to 18 months. That would line up perfectly with the Bitcoin bull market. What does that mean? Well, you see a massive drop on the effective federal funds rate. Guess what that does? That sends the stock market to the stratosphere. And guess what? Bitcoin is positively correlated with, with an extremely high um, confidence. The stock market. If we are seeing a pause now, and if we can confirm that we have had a pause, if Jerome Powell comes out and says one sentence and says, we have now paused, then we're looking for a rate drop in the next year to 18 months that'll line up perfectly with the middle of the bull market and you're seeing bitcoin pushing to 150 to 200 grand because of that so spend all of our time today talking about the effect of federal funds right but i think it's important hope you guys are understanding all of that mixed with mixed by adam said way to go jeb thanks for educating people on what what's happening in europe and why this has to end with russian defeat or else it's going to be a nightmare the thing is it's actually not so much and not to correct you because you're you're pretty much completely right mixed by adam the one thing i will say to that is that it's not just so much that it has to end in a russian defeat it has to the the here's the sad thing for the here's the sad thing for the ukrainians what the West actually kind of needs to happen here is that this drags out into a into a long term protracted war that never goes anywhere, because if the if if the Ukrainians get such an advantage that they're able to push into Moscow or, or able to just push into any part of Russia, and you know start a land ba a land incursion because Ukraine theoretically could do that with all the weaponry that we've gotten them. And we're able to take, Bul uh, not we, but the Russia, the Ukrainians were able to take Bulgarod uh, or rostov on don you know, we've, or, you know, even take back Crimea with Sevastopol being their only deep water port that's capable of creating new ships in the Black Sea. Um, or if they're able to push in here to Tula, uh, Br uh, Bryansk, or uh, or Oryol, or even up to Moscow, Smolensk. You know, Smolensk would be hard because it's up here near Belarus, but you get the point. Bryansk. Uh, Voronezh. Used to be uh you you uh, or Volga, uh, Volgograd, former Stalingrad. 
if the Ukrainians were able to push and take any of those targets, then Russian do uh, nuclear doctrine, pretty much every country that has a nuclear arsenal's doctrine, is that we use our nuclear arsenal when the uh, when the integrity of our homeland is, in is intact. So the tricky thing about the Russian-Ukrainian war is that it is in NATO's best interest that they not lose, but it's also in NATO's best interest that they not win too hard. Because if they start pushing into... Um, they start pushing into Russia, then what does Russia do? They're backed into a corner. They're going to lose. They've got these people on their front door with all this NATO hardware that is just absolutely annihilating them. What do they do? Well, it's not unlikely to see Vladimir Putin press the red button and try and launch a bunch of nukes to at least annihilate Ukraine. But while he's at it, because he knows there's going to be some kind of retaliation, why not go for NATO at the same time? This is a very tricky situation. And also you run into this situation in history that's never occurred before where what happens if, if Vladimir Putin pushes the red button on that nuclear arsenal, which in many cases is over 50 years old and nothing happens. And we know because there's launch signatures that he tried, but he failed to kill hundreds of millions of people or to annihilate, just wipe a, an entire nation off the face of the planet. What is the, what is the NATO response to that? How would you respond to that? I don't know how I would respond to that. If a leader in some far-off country tried to kill 10% of the Earth's population, 20, 30% of the Earth's population failed, what do you do with that? So it's in NATO's best interest, and this is the sad thing about the Russian-Ukrainian war. It is in NATO's best interest that Ukraine stay on the winning side, but that they not win so hard that they push all the way into Russia. I could talk on this all day, but it is something that you need to pay close attention to. And please, especially for my voters in the United States, understand that there is plenty of corruption and there's plenty of people that are just trying to profiteer off of this. But you do not want Russia to win this war because Russia will be knocking on Poland's door next and it'll be your children that are getting sent off to war, not the Ukrainians' children. And I don't want anybody being sent off to war. But I'm just telling you, if you don't want this war to be closer to home, just understand that the Russians are just crazy and desperate enough to try and launch something on NATO. And you don't want an Article 5 trigger. You don't want it. You don't want it. All right. <clears throat> About to wrap out today's stream. Do just want to let you also know today, guys, uh, that today's show is brought to you by Lux Algo. If you guys have not already signed up for Lux Algo, you absolutely should. Make sure to sign up using coupon code JEB30. That's J-E-B-B 30 for 30% 30 off at checkout, and you'll be getting access to the absolute best, hands down best technical indicator in the entire game. And also, guys, make sure to check out Apex Exchange. If you guys have not already, Apex Exchange is an incredible platform for leverage trading on a decentralized basis. It is one of the top decentralized exchanges for trading cryptocurrencies. It is the place that I go to use uh, whenever I'm trading cryptocurrencies on leverage. And if you understand leverage, if you're safe with it, if you have the ability, uh, if you have the knowledge and the uh, responsibility to use stop losses and, and use it properly, this is a great platform to go and do your leverage trading on. Easy interface, decentralized exchange, so you're always custodying your own funds, and you're also ensuring that you are... Uh, able to get up-to-date market data because of the way they pull all their data. You guys are going to be very excited, very happy to use Apex, so make sure to check that out with the link in the description box down below as well. Going to reach out here for just another second, and then we're going to wrap it out. Isn't it that America does that whole life, attacking other countries as savior? Yeah, look, it is really... Uh, I really do not envy at all the plight of the Ukrainian. I. It is a very... It's a very, very, very shockingly terrible place that they are in right now. If you have seen some of the, hor the the horrible travesties that have occurred over there, then you know what I'm talking about. It is absolutely disgusting what the Russians have done. And I'm not saying the Ukrainians are perfect either. Um, But it's, uh, war is terrible. That's what they say, and they're absolutely right. OMA season chat said good morning. All right. All right, guys, really appreciate all of you for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's stream, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, hit that post notification bell so you won't miss a single episode. OMAC just donate, uh, just did a member's chat, said, I was stationed in Germany for several years. Ukraine does not have enough soldiers or the experience to pull off that type of move. Russia would not press the button. They would not win. That's what I'm, yeah, well, I don't want to, I don't want to doubt you there, OMAC, because I know that you were in the service and I was not. And I absolutely understand that Ukraine does not have enough soldiers to pull off a full scale incursion of Russia. My point is, what if they capture a city? What if they put that fear into the leadership of Russia? We don't even know how fragmented the Russian government is. We don't understand if Putin even has full control over the entire military complex as it stands. We, you, the guy has almost been killed by um, 
multiple assassination attempts from many different countries, some of them internally. It's surprising that he's even still on his little iron throne over there. And so the issue that I'm bringing up is not even so much that the Russians would do it because it was logical. It's more so that they might do it because of the fear. What happens if they try and press that button? They might not, but they might, and you don't want that. It is definitely in NATO's best interest and in the Ukrainian's best interest, obviously, that they win the war rather than lose it. But my point is that the Russia, that NATO understands that they want to be careful about how hard the Ukrainians win it at the same time. Because if the Ukrainians have, you know, a bunch of F-16s, they have a bunch of long-range weaponry, and they're, you know, leveling Moscow with, you know, long-range long rockets, then what, do, what does Russia do? I do, you, don't, you don't want to find out. I don't want to find out. All right. If you guys enjoyed today's stream, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Thank you all for tuning in. And before I go, I do just first want to thank each and every single last one of you for watching, as always. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.